Good evening and thank you very much indeed for your very kind invitation to come along and talk to you about Anthony Trollope, his life and works. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here uh, and particularly pleased in this week that Theresa May has announced her formal plans for Brexit that I managed to get here without having to apply for a visa. Um, so, um, Anthony Trollope, um, arguably one of the four or five leading English writers of the 19th century, uh, mid to late 19th century, and alongside Dickens, uh, Thackeray, George Eliot perhaps, I would say he's perhaps the one who is uh, most neglected uh, and uh, most overlooked uh, now in the 21st century. And I think what I'd like to talk to you about is uh, how uh, his life impacted on his work and uh, in that respect, uh, I'd like to quote the words of W.H. Auden, the English poet. He said that, Of all novelists in any country, Trollope best understands the role of money. Compared with him, even Balzac is too romantic. And what I'd like to show is how, through uh, understanding his life, you can see how money became such a, a, a crucial part of his thinking and therefore a crucial part of his uh, uh, his writing. So, Anthony Trollope was born in London in 1815, uh, the year of Waterloo, which uh, makes him a war baby. And uh, he was the son of Thomas Trollope, uh, a barrister in London, uh, and his wife Fanny. Now, I know that you have a slightly different um, legal system here in Germany, so a little explanation. Thomas Trollope was a barrister uh, and as such didn't have any direct clients uh, and relied for uh, his work uh, on referrals uh, of, of clients by solicitors, the other category of lawyer in the UK. And really by a combination of, of bad temper and being very antisocial, um, he managed to uh, put off all of all of his uh, solicitor uh, contacts uh, and basically um, failed to um, gain enough briefs um, jobs uh, 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 to to maintain his practice uh, and so was constantly in a state of, of, of financial difficulties uh, the outcome of which was that much of the um, upkeep of the family um, fell on his wife Fanny who uh, rose to the occasion uh, very successfully uh, she started to write uh, books for money uh, and writing for money is going to become something of a theme uh, in this uh, understanding of Trollope. Uh, so Fanny uh, wrote a, a runaway bestseller um, called uh, The Domestic Manners of Americans which was uh, based on her experiences when she went to the States uh, and tried to run a, a large sort of bazaar uh, in Cincinnati and uh, that failed financially but she used the experiences to talk about the Americans and describe them as uh, uh, rude uh, uh, and uncouth uh, uh, and spitting in the streets and, and, and basically she took the mickey out of the Americans uh, which went down incredibly well um, uh, with the, the, the British reading public uh, and she became a runaway bestseller um, and uh, her practice uh, of, of fitting in her writing in, in sort of around her family responsibilities became uh, the model for, for Anthony's own um, writing around uh, his uh, career as a public servant. Now Thomas Trollope had a very clear idea of, of how his sons were going to be educated. Uh, it was going to follow the pattern of his own education. Um, they were to go to Harrow School, uh, one of the uh, most famous public schools in the UK. Uh, very exclusive school, uh, predominantly uh, for the sons of the rich. Uh, uh, and then they were to go to Winchester and then on to University at Oxford uh, following the pattern that uh, Thomas himself had done. And it has to be said that um, Anthony's older brother, also called Thomas after his father, 
um, really seem to prosper um, along this path, whereas unfortunately Anthony, um, it has to be said, did not. And uh, when Anthony arrived at Harrow, um, he was actually um, seen as one of the, the, the poor boys uh, at, at the school and as a result got rather bullied by the um, sons of the rich who were uh, uh, there and you know, what's perhaps even more amazing I is that his older brother Thomas actually took part in this bullying of Anthony uh, uh, and so uh, as Anthony later recalled in his autobiography there clung to me a feeling that I'd been looked upon always as an evil an encumbrance a useless thing or as a creature of whom those connected with him had to be ashamed. And I acknowledged the weakness of a great desire to be loved, of a strong wish to be popular with my associates. No child, no boy, no lad, no young man had ever been less so. And I'd been so poor and so little able to bear poverty. And I think this response to um, his poverty um, became so deeply uh, a part of Anthony's psyche that it, it comes out many, many times uh, in his writing subsequently. Um, so he's at Harrow School, uh, and like many of his illustrious uh, colleagues at the school, um, he carved his name, uh, or had it carved, uh, into the wood panelling of the classroom which you can see here. Now at this time uh, Anthony's father Thomas had uh, a big farmhouse built for the family in uh, Harrow. Uh, it, it, for some reason he thought that having been a failure as a barrister he would try his hand at farming and of course he had no experience and was a complete disaster as a farmer as well uh, uh, managing to lose the family yet more money. Uh, and, uh, this illustration is actually taken from uh, uh, one of Anthony's uh, novels written decades later uh, called Orley Farm and the illustration is by Millet and it's actually of the very house that uh, Anthony lived in as a child and as you can see it's quite an extravagant looking farmhouse, uh, quite large uh, typical of, of the family, both uh, Thomas and Fanny Trollope were, were, were extravagant, uh, managing to spend what money um, Fanny uh, brought in as a writer, pretty much like water. Uh, uh, and so as a result, uh, they were ultimately forced out of the, 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 the house by bailiffs uh, as a result of uh, bankruptcy. And I do wonder uh, what Trollope was trying to work through when he had Millet use this picture of his old house um, many, many years later uh, as an illustration of one of his novels. Uh, it does really beg the question uh, as to what he was going through. Uh, but as was so often the case with uh, English people who got into difficulties, uh, financial difficulties, um, they fled to the continent. Uh, uh, and wound up in Bruges. Now in fact Anthony wasn't very uh, long in Bruges before his mother started to pull strings, uh, used friends of friends uh, and managed to get him a job uh, in the post office in the UK. Uh, so he moved back to London on his own and uh, joined the post office or at least tried to, though it has to be said his um, initial uh, attempt was in fact completely unsuccessful. Um, he, he was uh, to be engaged uh, really as e effectively uh, uh, copying out letters, uh, effectively given there were no photocopies back then, uh, they, they had reams of uh, staff who, whose job was simply to copy out letters, uh, human photocopiers. But uh, sadly, um, Anthony on his first attempt produced such a, 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 a messy copy of a letter with such a, appalling handwriting and, and, and blotting and so on uh, that he, he was uh, just rejected uh, and his mother was forced to pull yet more strings uh, to uh, get him a second chance and uh, the illustration you see um, is taken from a 
copy of a novel, The Three Clerks, uh, which was published in 1857, so much later, in which um, he describes this incident um, and how he was uh, given a second chance and allowed at home to make uh, a, another attempt to copy uh, a passage out and then he took it in to be uh, reviewed the following morning and found no one paid any attention to it he was just sat down and set to work so uh, began his life uh, working for the post office and he described himself as a, as a hobbledehoy now I don't know if uh, you have an equivalent word in German for that uh, it, it's quite an archaic um, English expression but it means basically a young man who's just useless good for nothing uh, and in the novel The Three Clerks, he describes um, his misadventures as a young man about town in London. Um, he's got a little bit of money, manages to get himself into debt the way that young boys uh, can do when they're away from home for the first time. He gets into wine, women and song and uh, really just manages to make a complete mess of his life. Uh, so much so that and he actually recounts these incidents um, in fictional form in The Three Clerks. Um, he seems to have managed to propose to some uh, young woman uh, and had her mother actually turn up at his office uh, and demand, you know, when are you going to marry my daughter? Uh, which kind of really gone down very well with um, his boss or his colleagues. Um, he also uh, got himself into debt and had um, the money lender come into the office uh, and stand over him and sort of demand payment of interest he said, and please be punctual is the phrase that uh, crops up uh, in his fiction which is derived from the the, the way that this uh, money lender treated him in his early days at the post office so as you can imagine um, he's not viewed in a great light by um, his uh, his boss uh, in the post office and so the the boss when the first opportunity arises manages to um, basically get him posted uh, overseas uh, all the um, overseas from London means uh, a posting to Ireland and amazingly um, this posting to Ireland in 1841 uh, it, it's the making of Anthony he for the first time in his life he gets uh, a little bit of responsibility and he takes it and he makes something of himself uh, uh, and uh, becomes starts to turn his his life around and so uh, he, he's riding uh, all around Ireland uh, looking to uh, reorganize and uh, improve the efficiency of the of the postal service there and part of that he actually because he's riding around he, he, he spends yet more money uh, that he probably hadn't really got uh, on buying a, a, a good quality ha hunter uh, a horse to go out hunting with and that really starts to introduce him uh, into the better classes of society he's an Englishman um, in Ireland and the English are uh, an elite uh, in that country the sort of a ruling elite uh, and he becomes part of that ruling elite and for his status is improving and he, he, he joins in their pastimes uh, and, and takes up hunting which um, as he says in his autobiography um, I've ever since been constant to the sport having learned to love it with an affection which I cannot myself fathom or understand surely no man has ever laboured at it as I have done or hunted under such drawbacks as to distances money and natural disadvantages nor have I ever been in truth a good horseman but nothing has ever been allowed to stand in the way of hunting neither the writing of books nor the work of the post office nor other pleasures and I think what's easy to overlook is that he's again he's this young man he's actually really what he's getting through hunting is the opportunity to flirt with girls because hunting was one of the few places where he would be able to meet women young women uh, without a chaperone because ordinarily you're meeting a nice girl there would always be someone chaperoning her to make sure that nothing untoward happens but when you're out in the field the chaperone if she's 
there at all. She's on a horse and she's got to try and keep up with the young woman who can probably outride her. Which means that there's this fantastic opportunity for the young men to chat up young girls. It's just brilliant. Anthony loves it. Uh, and in fact, he does indeed meet a young woman, though uh, not actually uh, whilst out hunting. He meets a woman called Rose Heseltine uh, and uh, falls in love with her. And in 1844, they get married. So now uh, he's got uh, family responsibilities. Uh, they have two children, Henry in 1846 and Frederick in 1847. And he's got these additional responsibilities. And what does he do? He remembers how his mum dealt with these additional financial responsibilities. And he thinks, I can have a go at this writing lark. And he describes uh, in his autobiography how uh, when he was out walking with his friend John Merivale near a place called Drumsnar in the middle of Ireland, uh, he, he says, We turned up through a deserted gateway along a weedy, grass-grown avenue to the modern ruins of a country house. It was one of the most melancholy spots I've ever visited. We wandered about the place, suggesting to each other causes for the misery we saw there. And while I was still amongst the ruined walls and decayed beams, I fabricated the plot of the McDermott's of Ballycloran. Sadly, however, uh, the novel pretty much disappeared without trace. Uh, critics were overall reasonably favourable in their reviews, but uh, as Anthony recalled uh, in his autobiography, uh, hardly any copies were sold. Uh, now this was actually the first um, novel of Trollope's that I ever read. Uh, and uh, it starts out with a very uh, moving uh, and evocative uh, description of, of the, 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 the life and uh, homes uh, and living standards of, of the poor in uh, Ireland at the time. And I have to say it's a, a, a very bleak picture that's painted. And that then goes on to set the scene really for, for, for the tragedy that follows. And so it, it, it's a gothic romance uh, uh, with tragic consequences, which I think is possibly um, underrated uh, amongst uh, uh, the novels of Trollope. Uh, I think it, it, it does stand up well as a first novel. And probably more so than the, the second novel, uh, which followed the following year, The Kellys and the O'Kellys. Um, so I I if, if I just digress a little here onto the Trollope's Irish novels, um, he's, he's, he's living in Ireland for 20-some for years and wrote about uh, the Irish people uh, and their plight uh, in a number of novels. Uh, covered in detail uh, by the analysis of Professor John McCourt of University Roma Trey in his book uh, Writing the Frontier um, in which uh, McCourt recognises that Trollope wrote about Ireland and Irish people uh, particularly at the time of the, the Great Famine of the 1840s when uh, Trollope was first working in Ireland uh, with uh, some accuracy and some uh, sympathy for the Irish uh, position. Uh, however, uh, when you look at uh, work like Castle Richmond, written later in 1860, Trollope's quite accepting of the, the, the way that the English government dealt with the famine, uh, or failed to deal with the famine, uh, with the result that... Uh, hundreds of thousands of people died or uh, literally starved to death. This in a country that was still exporting food to the rest of the British Empire. Uh, uh, but the people uh, were allowed to starve to death uh, in a way that's just very, very difficult to understand from a 21st century perspective. And Trollope's position on this, um, he describes in Castle Richmond, he's quite critical of um, the the way that there would be like soup kitchens um, uh, uh, trying to feed the the poor and he he's critical of this this 
uh, approach to charity, uh, taking, uh, I think, quite a Victorian attitude that um, people should not just be given uh, a charity, um, but should in some way be working to earn their 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 uh, their food, as it were. Uh, difficult, to, very very difficult to to understand now, but thinking about it in the context of uh, uh, the Victorian ethos uh, of uh, pulling oneself up by one's own bootstraps. Um, you know, Trollope was doing that himself. Um, he he had, by his own efforts, got himself turned around from being hopelessly in debt uh, to being, by 1860, uh, one of the most successful authors in the country uh, and a very rich man. Uh, and, and so you, you need to understand in that context uh, his attitude uh, to, to uh, the charity. And he's also quite rightly critical that um, much of that charity was um, carried out by the Church of Ireland uh, on, the, on the basis that the Catholic uh, population should convert to Protestantism uh, in order to receive uh, the, the, the the benefits of the charity, so you know, quite rightly critical of, of, of that requirement. We then move on um, in Trollope's Irish uh, novels uh, to much later, 1879. And by this stage, uh, Trollope's uh, a, a hugely successful uh, writer, very very secure financially, uh, and writes an eye for an eye, uh, which uh, is. A, a, a a very intense, uh, quite short uh, uh, novel uh, with um, a, a very psychological uh, approach uh, to uh, a, a, a very unhappy love story uh, between a, a, an Irish girl who's trying to, um, if you like, snare an Englishman, um, if you take the English perspective, and the exploitation uh, by the Englishman of the, the, the poor Irish girl, uh, if you take the alternative perspective. We then finally come to uh, Trollope's last, um, actually unfinished novel, um, The Land Leaguers, uh, which was published posthumously in 1883, uh, which addresses um, Irish politics uh, and actually it, it is not unsympathetic to, to the Irish position. Um, Trump's very clearly still writing from an English perspective, um, from the, the English landowner's uh, position, as it were, but he's not so partisan, perhaps, as, uh, as he was earlier in his writing career. He also um, wrote... Uh, a number of short stories based in Ireland, uh, and uh, a couple of those worth mentioning. Uh, the O'Connors of Castle Connor, uh, based on, uh, it has to be said, uh, events from his own uh, travels as a, a young man in Ireland. Uh, here we have uh, the young uh, Englishman invited to the uh, castle of one of the local squires, and finds he's expected to, to be attending a dance and has only his riding boots on. And so he manages to persuade the, um, the, the, uh, the butler to swap boots uh, with him. So he's got uh, indoor shoes, so he's able to dance. And the poor butler, he, he, he's trying to serve dinner uh, wearing uh, riding boots that are too small for him. Uh, and you, you you picture him sort of like wincing at every step as he as he serves dinner, uh, it, it, it recalling basically an incident from from Trollope's own um, life uh, uh, on the road as a young man, as indeed does uh, the, the 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 story Father Giles of Ballymoy, uh, wherein he recites the tale of how uh, a young uh, man, Trollope by any other name. Uh, rides into town uh, and takes a room at uh, a local inn, puts himself to bed and um, wakes up in the middle of the night to find a stranger has intruded into his bedroom and is about to get into his bed. Manages to get up, 
wrestle the man out of the door, throws him down the stairs, uh, only for it to be revealed that this is in fact uh, Father Giles, uh, the local parish priest, uh, Catholic priest, who uh, has uh, very kindly agreed to let um, this young stranger share his room uh, that, that, that he has at the inn. And, you know, Trollope, uh, the young hero of the story, uh, is only uh, just saved from being lynched by the locals who've been woken up by the, 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 the noise of Father Giles being thrown down the stairs and injuring himself uh, by the intervention of Father Giles. Uh, and it has to be said that uh, this incident, uh, uh, true story, uh, possibly slightly exaggerated, uh, uh, the, the real life Father Giles uh, and, and Anthony Trollope did in fact become lifelong friends. Uh, and um, his uh, view of the educated Catholic priests uh, like Father Giles, who'd uh, been educated abroad, uh, was... Uh, very favourably coloured by um, that relationship with um, the original um, for Father Giles. So um, that's uh, Trollope's Irish novels, a, a, a digression ahead in time. So we need to go back now, spool back uh, to 1850. Uh, the first two um, Irish novels written, published, disappearing pretty much without trace. So Trollope, 1850 decides he's got to take another tack. Uh, so rather than writing Irish novels, um, his publisher suggests he tries an alternative and he comes up with uh, a tale of the French Revolution, uh, La Vendée, which, frankly, it's <laughs> it's his worst novel, I think, in many people's opinion. Uh, it's pretty dreadful. And uh, deservedly, probably, uh, disappears without trace. So three failures uh, uh, to Trollope's uh, name already. And uh, he then, in 1851, uh, he seconded to England uh, and uh, sent to the southwest where he's carrying out the same sort of inspector role as he's had in Ireland, trying to put right the uh, inefficiencies of uh, the, the postal uh, service in the area and he goes to Salisbury where he has a flash of inspiration and uh, uh, he sees the cathedral the, the cathedral close and thinks ah I have a possible plot drawing actually on uh, a, 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 a current controversy uh, which um, related to the way that uh, trusts had been set up historically um, by benefactors for the uh, provision of assistance to the poor and these were being administered by the church and it turned out that the the the, the poor were seeing very little of the uh, vast amounts of money that had been accumulated in these trusts and the bulk of the money was being paid out uh, to the clergymen who were running it in a way that seemed to be uh, rather, if not fraudulent, uh, fraudulent at least uh, very contrary to the spirit of, of, of the, the original intention of the trust uh, when it was uh, created. And Trump thinks, fantastic idea, I can, I can make something of this, and he comes up with this beautiful uh, man, Mr. Harding, who is one of these clergymen who's receiving far too much money out of one of these trusts uh, and he has a conscience and when he's challenged he actually realizes that it's wrong and wants to try to 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 to, to set things right uh, much to the disgust of his fellow clergymen who clearly want the uh, status quo to continue so there we have suddenly the the, the plot for um, Trollope's fourth novel, uh, 1855, The Warden, which also disappears without trace. But Trollope's, he's convinced uh, uh, that he's, he's actually onto something. Uh, and he, he conceives this idea of, of, of Barchester and uh, the, the life of the clergyman there. And it, I, I, 
I have to say that there's, there's, there's very little actual religion in the these books about clergymen. It's all about people, about how uh, they make their careers and, and the, the, if you like, the office politics uh, of the clergy back then, which is as real today as it was uh, in the 1850s. Uh, and you have some wonderfully drawn characters um, uh, uh, facing the sort of dilemmas that, that uh, show real humanity. We have, I mean, the, the, for example, the, this, the, the Dean uh, 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 of Barchester in Barchester Towers, the second in the series, uh, he's faced with this terrible dilemma because his father, the bishop, is dying. And if his father dies quickly, then there's every likelihood that he will get his father's job as the bishop if the government doesn't fall first. But if his father hangs on and the government falls, he's then most unlikely to get the job. So he wants his father to live because he loves his father, but he wants his father to die because he'll get the job and yet he loves his father. And the dilemma, oh, it's, it's just so insightful into how people uh, can try to cope with ambition and love and the conflict between them is superb characterization and so he builds this this whole series of six novels each one sort of independent from but building on what's gone before and it's in these that he he, he really hits his stride and i think in many ways drawing on his, his his own love for, for the works of Jane Austen uh, from the, the, the beginning of the 19th century. He, he, he creates a, a series of love stories uh, that they're always, he, he feels there needs to be a romance in, 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 in a novel. There needs to be, be, you know, girl meets boy, boy meets girl, they fall in love, they, 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 they face obstacles and they overcome them and they, 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 they get married. In, the girl always gets the guy, or the guy always gets the girl uh, in the end. And you're never really in doubt, but yet there always seems to be the insurmountable. So there's tension, and yet you know there's going to be a happy ending. And it's a brilliant, I won't say a formula, because th they, these are anything but formulaic, but it's a, it's a brilliant schema. Uh, to, to, to follow uh, one that's very very uh, uh, appealing without ever falling into the trap of being repetitive and it's in these that um, uh, as Henry James uh, the uh, author o observed that um, Trollope settled down steadily to the English girl he took possession of her and turned her inside out he bestowed upon her the most serious, the most patient, the most tender, the most copious consideration. He has presented the English maiden under innumerable names, in every station, and in every emergency of life. And I think that captures a very important thing about Trollope, because I think of all Victorian English writers, male writers, possibly male writers of any era, um, he's understood what it's like to be a woman at at that time. The dilemmas that they face, the the the, the impossible calls that are uh, that they're, they're forced to be pulled in two directions. They've got to marry well, and get a husband uh, with money uh, if they don't have money, or they have to try to gain social standing because they have money but lack the social standing. And how marriage was really for 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 ladies. That is to say, what we would call now middle class women. Um, it was really the only game in town. They had no other possible career than marriage uh, that was respectable. And I don't think anyone has conveyed this issue better than Trollope. And he said, um, 
that in doing this, uh, one of the things he, he, he had to do was to be a pie maker uh, and, and talked about how he must uh, uh, always bake his pies sweet to the taste of the public. He understood the need to, 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 to cater to the market in a way that was really very modern um, I I I in thinking. Uh, but it's a way that, that runs contrary to this romantic idea of the artist with his muse and how he must struggle to create his art. He, he saw himself much more as a craftsman uh, and, you know, his working practice uh, the, the, the was very much the artisan, not the, 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 the artist. Um, I mean, at this time, he, he, he had a, he'd employed a groom called Barney McIntyre, who, who he gave an extra job to, uh, which was uh, to get him up at four o'clock every morning, and he paid him an extra five pounds a year uh, for, 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 for doing this, so that he would be up uh, and writing from about 5.30 every morning before the rest of the household was up. And he'd be writing for three hours, maybe, uh, at, at a steady rate, and he, he, he had a, a watch, he, he timed himself, and he's 250 words to every quarter of an hour to, to churn out the novels. Uh, and he, he talked about uh, being, uh, using about cobbler's wax uh, and, and sticking to the task. And that didn't sit well with uh, the critics uh, when they uh, read that this was his approach uh, in his autobiography. It was one of the reasons why his critical reputation uh, plummeted uh, following his death. But that's uh, maybe getting a bit of ahead of ourselves. Um, so um, we're still sort of like 1851. Um, he's still working full-time for the post office as well as being probably the best-selling author of, of his time. Uh, how he manages to, to, to juggle these two, of course, it, it depends totally on this uh, uh, ability to, to work hard morning, noon and night. Uh, uh, and in his day job at the post office um, in 1851, he, he introduces the pillar box to the UK. Um, didn't actually um, invent the pillar box. It was, uh, he saw it being used in France, uh, in Paris, but brought it over uh, to the UK. By 1853, he'd been promoted. He was responsible for the Northern District of Ireland. Uh, and then he, he sort of gained a sort of a roving role um, for the post office. Uh, 1858, um, he was tr sent really all over the world, um, the Middle East, uh, where he was sent to negotiate for uh, post to travel through the Suez Canal from uh, England on its way to India. And while he was there, he actually used the opportunity to, to, to come up with new ideas for, for, his, um, for his writing. He wrote a, a, a very funny um, little story, um, The Unprotected Female at the Pyramids, based on those experiences. And then he went to the West Indies and put right the uh, terrible muddle uh, of the postal system uh, over, the, over the Caribbean and used that experience to write a travelogue about the West Indies, uh, which uh, of all of his uh, travel writing is, to my mind, the most lyrical. Uh, it's less factual, more about the experience of the, of the place. Then finally, in 1859, um, he's transferred to the to to take charge of the Eastern District of England. Uh, so he's he's able to buy a big house on uh, the outskirts of London, at Waltham Cross, and becomes uh, a man about town, uh, a, a clubbable man. Uh, becomes members of uh, a number of clubs like the Athenaeum in London and gets to meet the the, the sort of um, upper class set that he, he, he'd always aspired to, to, to be accepted within. Then 
1867, um, he resigns from the post office uh, to concentrate on his writing. At least that's the story in, in actual fact. Um, uh, he tried for the top job in the post office uh, and failed to get it. Uh, and basically threw his toys out of the pram and uh, resigned in a fit of pique largely because um, he really didn't get on well with uh, the chap who got the job, Roland Hill, uh, the inventor of the Penny Black stamp. So, um, suddenly free to carry on his writing career uh, unencumbered by a day job, um, he decides to go into politics. Uh, now, he was on record uh, uh, as saying that the, the greatest aspiration uh, for an Englishman is to be a member of Parliament uh, and so in 1868 he stands as a Liberal candidate uh, for the by-election in Beverley and comes last. He was um, very uh, affected by this very traumatic experience uh, and recycled it several times uh, in novels including um, a, a couple of times in uh, his, what might be called his political novels, uh, also known as the Palaces, um, series about politicians, but not politics. Uh, just as the Barsetshire novels had been about clergymen without touching on religion, um, the, there is next to no uh, politics in the political novels. Um, there's only the human interaction, the sort of like the backroom deals and so on. Uh, the only real um, policy that's ever uh, discussed, um, <laughs> in actual fact, it's, it's held up to ridicule, um, is uh, the central character Plantagenet Palliser, uh, who eventually, um, in the fifth book in the series, becomes the prime minister. Um, his obsession, his monomania. Um, his desire to introduce decimal currency which of course is laughable when you're dealing with uh, pounds with 20 shillings to the pound and 12 pence to the shilling it's just crazy to try and have 100 pence to the pound isn't it but uh, through the course of these six political novels um, Trollope continues to explore the issues uh, of things like personal responsibility and so on. Uh, and at the end, y you actually um, find in the Duke's children, we actually ha have uh, the, 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 the story of a single father trying to bring up his children, uh, his wayward children who will insist on trying to have their own way um, in a very clear sort of uh, description of, of, of the, the generation gap and the, 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 uh, the wish for the older generation to impose its will on the younger generation but failing to do so. Uh, and we have in the Duke, uh, who's Plantagenet Palliser, the loving father, and he really loves his children. It's very obvious how much he cares about them, but he's struggling to, to try to get them to see things his way, and of course they don't. Uh, and I'd like to talk a, a little bit at length about um, the, the Duke's children, because um, this novel was um, actually published um, uh, after a drastic um, cut. Um, Chapman and Hall published it um, in demanded that it should be in a three volume edition not of the four volume that it was actually written so Trollope had to go through and cut 65,000 words out to, to, to get it to fit to three volumes and that full length version the, the original manuscript of that was, was, was held at, uh, ultimately at, at Yale University's uh, Beinecke Library uh, and uh, Professor Stephen Amarnik uh, took better part of 10 years uh, uh, in the run-up to, to, to 2015, um, reconstructing the original four volumes. And, and it made incredibly difficult because when you're crossing out so many words, you inevitably need to sometimes insert new words to make sense of what's left. 
uh, and so Professor Romanek had to try to decipher the different types of cuts. What were the heavy crossings out that were, if you like, Trollope's artistic decisions, and which were the um, slightly lighter crossings out um, that were um, cuts that he was making purely to satisfy the publishers. Uh, tremendously difficult job, uh, uh, and uh, taking a uh, full decade for, for him to and his team to, to, to achieve, but finally they, they, they managed it. And in 2015, um, in association with the Folio Society, he managed to publish what you might call the, the, the full version. Uh, at great expense, uh, though it, I'm very pleased to be able to, to, to say that, that there's now going to be a, an Everyman uh, edition uh, due out in April 2017, which is uh, much more reasonably priced. And I've actually done an, a, a, a side by side reading and analysis comparing the two, and the, the, the depth. Of, of characterization that that you f you find in the full version uh it, it it's just so much more uh clarity about the motives uh, uh and feelings of, of everyone concerned it, it's just a superb uh, uh reconstruction but again that's getting ahead of ourselves uh Again, thinking about the, the political series, that goes right through until very close to, to, to Trollope's death. But if we can go back uh, to, to the sort of like mid-1860s, um, Trollope's now really hugely successful, very wealthy man. Um, and and he, he does wonder, you know, is it my name that's selling them or is it the, the actual uh, works themselves? And so he publishes a couple of, uh, 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 of novels anonymously. Nina Balatka and Linda Tressel, um, uh, both of which fail miserably. So it becomes very clear that it's actually his name that's selling them. But these, I, 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 I like to classify as, as Trollope's bohemian um, novels. They're, they're, they're more experimental. They're getting away from the, the classic English settings. You know, Nina Balatka set in Prague, uh, Linda Tressel set in Nuremberg, and Trollope's starting to, 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 to look at new settings uh, and, and extend uh, the range. Uh, so y you have things like Lotta Schmidt and other stories published in 1867, The Golden Line of Grandpa in, in 1872, which um, it, it is, is uh, set on the continent, Why Froman Raised Her Prices, and other stories published in 1882. I mean, that's basically a wo about a woman f running an inn and wondering how to put up her prices. You know, it's economics, and he's making uh, uh, stories, making entertainment out of, out of that. You know, he's actually challenging the boundaries of, of what's possible. Which is it, it, it's moving on from the traditional way of uh, of describing the continent uh, in English novels at the time, which was just the other place where things could happen. It, you know, you'd go to Baden Baden, not a million miles from here, uh, 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 and it would be possible for people to misbehave there in a way that they, when they're on holiday, that they would never do when they're back in the UK. But Trump's now going beyond that and uh, and actually sort of like writing about real people uh, in these locations um, rather than having them as just the other place as some sort of plot device. Which really brings us now on to, to, to Trump's late style, uh, as, I, as I think of it, uh, when he started to, to move away from... Uh, what you might call Jane Austen romances and, and deal with really much more difficult issues. So we, we come to things like He Knew He Was Right, published in 1869. And that's almost a reverse. Uh, the, 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 the couple fall in love and marry in chapter one and then the whole novel is uh, about the tragic breakdown of their marriage. Uh, and it looks at insanity. The, 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 the husband is jealous 
to the point of insanity about his wife's behavior. She's not behaving exactly as a nice English girl should, but she's not being unfaithful. And so it's you're dealing with it, women's rights. You know, at that point, she was his property. This is eight, 1869, before the, the Married Women's Property Act of the 1880s. And so he can literally take her child away from her and deprive her of access and there is nothing she can do about it. What she, 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 the only thing she can do is go to court and try to prove that he's insane and so is not a fit parent um, to, to have charge of the, uh, of the child. Uh, and so this, this is really quite disturbing new ground um, to be considered in, in uh, Victorian um, English fiction of the 19th century. And then we get on to um, the, the Vicar of Bullhampton the following year in 1870, where he's actually looking at prostitution. Uh, and in fact, he, he felt that for the first time there was a need to actually put a preface to a novel. He, he was uh, never keen on them. But he, he, he said, There arises, of course, the question of whether a novelist who professes to write for the amusement of the young of both sexes should allow himself to bring upon his stage such a character as that of Carrie Brattle. That's the prostitute in question. It's not long since, indeed it's well within the memory of this author, that the very existence of such a condition of life as was hers was supposed to be unknown to our sisters and daughters and was, in truth, unknown to many of them. Whether that ignorance was good may be questioned, but that it exists no longer is beyond question. So he's really pushing the boundaries now. Uh, and uh, in, in a way that was quite inspiring to other writers at the same time. Um, he gave a copy to uh, uh, Marion Evans, uh, who wrote under the name George Eliot, uh, uh, and she, she said, um, I'm not at all sure that, but for Anthony Trollope, I should never have planned my studies on so extensive a scale for Middlemarch, or that I should, through all of its episodes, have persevered with it to the close. So you're actually seeing, would George Eliot have written the Middle March we know it today if it were not for Trollope and, and the way he um, was writing at that time? And then we move on to, to Lady Anna uh, a few years later, uh, which is looking at class issues. Um, there we have uh, a legal case brought um, really to establish whether or not Lady Anna th in question really is the legitimate daughter uh, uh, of the aristocrat who's claiming that she's not because his marriage to her mother was a bigamous marriage. So without getting into the, 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 the plot details, um, basically her mother um, spends all of her money uh, in trying to fight the case uh, and then relies on the, the, the money of a tailor uh, uh, who takes up her case uh, on her behalf. And then, uh, wouldn't you know it, um, Lady Anna falls in love with the tailor's son and we've got, you know, but he's from trade. He, it's just not right that uh, an aristocrat should be in love with and marry uh, a, a tradesman. And so we see that the sort of the, the class barriers being challenged. And then we, we move on to what many people regard uh, as uh, Trollope's classic, The Way We Live Now, uh, written in 1875, which is about finance and, and corruption. Uh, and what I think of as a Ponzi scheme, um, which I believe you call here a, a, a snowball scheme, where uh, the, the, the central character uh, managed to persuade uh, people to, to part with money uh, and then... Uh, promises them dividends and then sells uh, more shares to new um, investors and uses that money to pay the the, the, the original investors and of course the, the, the whole thing is bound to fail in the end uh, and Trump uses this as a, as a, 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 a critique of the, 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 the corruption and the greed that he saw um, uh, all around him in the 1870s.
and of course it, it it's just equally applicable today um in the in a, a world where we have bankers uh, and financiers uh uh, and the, the, the it, it's almost like a prototype for for the the sort of Goldman Sachs masters of the universe kind of um, arrogance. And then we move on to um, eighteen seventy nine and uh, a, a novel John Caldergate, uh, which focuses on a, a, a question of whether or not a, a marriage is bigamous uh, and. Uh, actually hinges uh, the, the plot hinges on a, a piece of detection and so you can almost see this as a, as a forerunner of the detective um, novel where uh, y you have a, a clue it's based actually on, on, on the the franking date of a stamp uh, and whether or not that stamp existed at the date of the, 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 the that it's frank and uh, therefore a forgery is actually exposed through this um, very um, intricate clue which probably would only have a, a occurred to uh, someone like Trollope who'd spent his whole life in the post office but you know we've got clue based detection stories now years before Conan Doyle comes up with Sherlock Holmes we've got Trollope uh, perhaps influencing his contemporary uh, and friend Wilkie Collins uh, who wrote The Moonstone uh, uh, and The Woman in White and so on uh, also um, looking at, 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 at the way that legal relationships matter. Um, we have, for example, in uh, Dr. Wirtle's school, a uh, question of bigamy again. Uh, and these sort of issues became actually central to many of the plots of Wilkie Collins' novels. Albeit that um, Collins was writing it much more in the sensationalist um, genre, uh, whereas Trollope was still very much firmly in the, the mainstream. And the final novel I'd like to mention uh, of Trollope's uh, uh, is called The Fixed Period, uh, uh, published in 1882, uh, which is really, it, 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 to all intents and purposes, it, it's a dystopian um, sci-fi novel, uh, a, a forerunner of the, the, the likes of, of Logan's Run and Blade Runner, uh, the Hollywood movies where we see the uh, central character uh, approaching uh, the age at which uh, he will be euthanized uh, in order to fit in with the requirements of society of, of this future date. Um, and it's actually with probably a high degree of irony that um, the age at which the euthanasia is to take place um, is 67 uh, uh, in a book written by Trollope uh, when he was 66 uh, almost prophetic really because uh, within a year Trollope had suffered a stroke uh, and actually uh, died in 1882 which brings me to the end of, of my little exposition of uh, Trollope just like to end with a quotation from Henry James in Trollope's obituary who said he did not write for posterity he wrote for the day the moment but these are just the writers whom posterity is apt to put into its pocket so much of the life of his time is reflected in his novels that we must believe a part of the record will be saved Trollope will remain one of the most trustworthy though not one of the most eloquent of the writers who have helped the heart of man to know itself. His first, his inestimable merit, was a complete appreciation of the usual. And I think it's on that note that I'd like to end. Trollope understood people, and he wrote about them as characters, as real characters, and brought them to life for his readers. And he said... I think that Plantagenet Palliser, the Duke of Omnium, is a perfect gentleman. If he be not that, I am unable to describe a gentleman. And she, referring to Lady Glencora, is by no means a perfect lady. But if she be not all over a woman, then I am not able to describe a woman. I do not think it probable that my name will remain among those who in the next century will be known as the writers of English fiction. But if it does, 
The permanence of success will probably rest on the characters of Plantagenet Palliser, Lady Glencora and the Reverend Crawley.